Welcome to the Motoring Podcast, your weekly discussion of motoring news. This is episode 568 on Tuesday, the 5th of March, 2024. Hello, I'm Alan. Hello, I'm Andrew. And this week, we'll be raising an eyebrow at one set of numbers. In new new car news, we ask if five is the new magic number. And in points of interest, we ask what's in a name. But first, we have a tiny bit of follow-up. And thank you, everybody who got in touch with me last week with regards to my query about the agency model in car retail. Uh, Loads of people responded when I put the question out on Twitter to who could I speak to, and thank you for doing so. But this all centered around the question that occurred when we were discussing JLR stepping away and others, sorry, pausing, not stepping away, pausing their move to agency model. (laughs) Pausing until everyone's forgotten it was a pause, yeah. (laughs) Because we didn't, we weren't sure what is the makeup of it all. Who will be holding the financial can? Uh, and it turns out that we were right in our guess. Car brands, if they are utilizing the agency model, they are the ones that have on their books and on their spreadsheets the stock and therefore all the costs associated with that. It's no longer that the car dealer has bought the stock and then sells it on. At you know, within certain guidelines, but basically however they want to. Mm. It's the car brands themselves. You can see in the current climate, some car brands are going, Ooh, hang on, let's just pause on changing our business model so drastically, which it is for them. Yeah. And therefore having to show that on a spreadsheet, which might make people who are not educated in this very jumpy, if suddenly numbers are dramatically different. Mm. But equally, you can see why some car retailers in the current economic climate are going, actually, it's quite nice not to have that liability. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, and thanks everyone for the feedback on that. It's been re- it really good. It's, of all the topics when we say give us some feedback, I wasn't expecting that one to be the one that really <laughs> sparks so much interest, to be perfectly honest. We have the best listeners, you think? Yes, we do. We do. It's definitely the most educated listeners. Okay, Alan, hot off the press. I really hot off the press. In the I was still asleep when this was actually published. <laughs> uh, we have the new car registration figures for February 2024. Headline news: the registrations have risen by 14% to 84,886 units, the best performance for the month since 2004. Mm. Tell me, everyone. Does everybody feel like there is a massive surge in everybody going out and buying new cars? Or could I perhaps be a little risky by surmising that there might have been a bit of pre-registration going on prior to the 1st of March registration change? Hmm, I wonder. (laughs) You you may say that the car industry can't possibly comment. (laughs) Exactly that. It's saying it's the 19th month of consecutive growth. Again, as always, it's fleet sales are in there. The numbers for private, you know, are down 2.6%, but fleet is up 25.2%, making almost 65% market share uh, for fleet purchases uh, in the UK in February. Yes, that's astonishing, and that must be worrying for the car industry. Yes. Well, it is, because you look at the comments that they make, Yeah, that this press release has from SMMT, they're making it very clear that they're no bones about it. They're saying fleet is doing all the lifting, not just the heavy lifting. They're doing all the lifting here and they need that to be balanced out. They cannot have yeah. just fleet doing it. Cause let's not forget as well. Fleet isn't the profit generator. Mm-hmm. Private is the profit generator in the car industry. Fleet is volume. Yeah, absolutely that. Before we get to the best sellers list, uh, there's a couple of other statements in there. One of which, uh, and I'm going to quote here, while February's growth is positive and demonstrative of ongoing robust demand for the latest vehicles, the long-term picture will become clearer in March, the busiest market month. It's not the most confident statement, I think. No. And I think the SMMT is really quite careful about how they word these because they know that this is the release that everybody reads. To me, that says we're really a bit uncertain about what's going to happen next, given that there may well have been an awful lot of pre-registration this month. Yeah. Yeah, I think the March figures might be interesting. Will there be growth? Maybe not a lot of it. There might be with private because it's a new plate month. Well, n- <sighs> that's the only thing, though. I was going to say the opposite. 
Because I was going to say that the private will be buying up all the pre-reg and the fleet will be on the new ones and the fleet won't bother as much. Yeah, but still some people find it important to have a new, the, the latest registration, don't they? I, as a car person, I I thought it basically, fa- I, I had maybe it's because I'm old, okay? It's because I'm getting old. It's uh, But I'd stop remembering about new car registration m- month whenever I, but whenever I was, was younger, even when it went to the twice a year, it was still a big thing for me to, how long before I spotted the first one, did it, mm. what it was. Yeah, I, I think it's lost its luster. It has, which I think was part of the plan of moving it to twice a year, to be honest. I think, in theory, the car industry thinks that's a great idea because then you don't have this massive surge. Yeah. Uh, until it plays against them, in which case they don't, don't feel it's so great. Before we hit the top tens, let's have a quick look at Tristan Young's uh, fuel you put in your car breakdown. Thank you for sending that across to us, Tristan. That is much appreciated. Yes, as always. Petrol, 69.27% market uh, market share. That's a little smidgen down, a fraction of a percent down from February 2023. 17.66% are battery electric vehicles. Uh, that is up a percentage in a bit. That's good. Uh, from last year. It is. Diesel, 4,995, down 2% almost from last year. And plug-in hybrids, 7.18%, and that's up quite significantly by o- almost a percent, really, compared to last year. Is that the first time it's gone ahead of diesel? I think it is. Possibly. And this, and we're only talking for February. We're not talking year to date, by the way. No, we're point. not talking this year to date. The minute. Um, if you were suddenly going, hang on, those figures don't seem very large. <laughs> we're only talking February. Definitely only February there. I mean, year to date so far. If I just quickly look at those, then a plug-in hybrid is. It can't be the first time because plug-in hybrid is is like four thousand. Oh, yeah. yeah, it must be. Uh, or, or, or three three thousand seven hundred uh, registrations ahead. I mean, three thousand seven hundred is is like almost a uh, it's almost a golf or something, isn't it? But the worry there is Bev is still under sixteen percent for year to date yes. market share, and I don't again. Some companies will be doing fine because they pretty much or only do offer EVs. Mm-hmm. Other companies will be doing very badly. This is just the market average. Yes, uh, best sellers. Oh, sorry, best registers. I read the top of the table and it's wrong i know it's the top of the table every time uh, in a tenth the uh, voxel mocha 1513 registrations uh, number nine in the sand cash guy uh, number eight the tesla model y number seven the bmw one series uh, number six the mini 1828 uh, number five the uh, audi a3 1835 Fourth, the Kia Sportage. Third, the Volkswagen Turok. Second, the Volkswagen Golf 2203, and about 332 ahead of that. Uh, number one, the Ford Puma 2535. Still quite low numbers. <laughs> Still quite low. February is always low, despite yeah. the year on year trends, uh, etc. February, a low month because people don't really always have a lot of spare cash. Mm-hmm. And then first of March being the the new registration date it does tend to skew February to being the smaller. And it, did I say the short month bit as well? No, Possibly. you didn't say short month. No, I didn't. But that ain't short good. month as well. Mm-hmm. February traditionally the lowest number of registrations uh, in the year. Yep. A spreadsheet of doom. Oh, spreadsheet of doom. Yes, goodness me, I knew there was something I'd forgotten. Uh, <laughs> there's not a lot of doom on here. Uh, no. Whilst there is more than I'm going to go through that do uh, that have dropped, um, their percentage does not hit our criteria of fifteen minus fifteen percent uh, mm. year on year. So I'll start towards the top, and Bentley is down sixty one percent. Dacia is down twenty two percent. DS is down sixty two percent. That is quite a drop, actually, from two hundred and five to seventy eight vehicles. Yeah, that's got to be a worry for DS. Mm-hmm. Uh, Genesis is down 77%. Maserati is down 55%. Mazda is down 25%. D- that one there doesn't surprise me because I know Mazda dealers at both ends of the UK 
getting in touch with people and going, we've got some really good deals on Mazda right at the minute. Ah, uh, okay. Do you fancy a new CX-5? What about a Mazda 2? You could have a Mazda 2 hybrid to replace your Yaris hybrid. Ah, uh, okay. May have been a former Toyota dealer. Uh, okay. Uh, and then the other one, yeah. Uh, the other one I bought Mazda's from. Polestar is down uh, 74%. And Toyota, for the second month on the trot, is down, this time uh, 18%. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not sure why Toyota is down so much. No, it may just be supply chain. Mm, could be. Mm -hmm. Anyway, do you want to take us through the more positive? More positive, far more of those. So starting at the top again, uh, a bath. Uh, up 293.33%. This is the difference between having the, 500, the electric 500 and, and having or having nothing. Alpine up 58%, BMW up 65%, uh, Citroen 18.3%, Cooper 46%, GWM Aura 330% and registered 56 vehicles in February. Uh, Honda up 56%, Jaguar 136 Gosh, Jaguar, do they still exist? Jeep up 63%, Kia up 24%, Lexus up 18%, Mercedes-Benz up 47%. MG up 244.48%, Mini up 30, Nissan 28, Peugeot 28, Renault 28, Seat 42, Smart 1,460%. They registered 78 vehicles as opposed to five in February 2023. Uh, Subaru up 25%. It's nice to see Subaru actually reg having something to register about. Yes, it's a new Crosstrek, which... Goodness knows why they had to be selling that for ages. you pronounce it? Solterra. Solterra, thanks. Solterra is the electric one. Yeah. I've seen a couple of those around, but not very many. I've, I've seen one locally. I don't see a lot of BZ4Xs here either. Um, I haven't seen any of those on the road. See, no, I've seen, a, I've seen a few more than I've seen Solterras. Tesla up 39%. Other imports up 62.75% to 83 There we go. Lots of green on there, whether or not it was valid. Yeah, the SMMT in their statement uh, throughout the article that is linked in the show notes as ever is talking about trying to encourage private buyers and they um, put forward a number of suggestions on how to do that, how to make it more fair. Mm -hmm. I think that is not likely to happen in an election year for starters. And two, I would also suggest that's quite a hard sell mm -hmm. for any politician to say, Let's give money to these people to put shiny things on their drives rather than worry about the roads, the NHS, the police, you know, everything else in the country. Yes, but, but this is where our opinions differ in that it's far easier to do that than to worry about the roads, the NHS, the police and everything else in the country. <laughs> and uh, I think that the current political climate in the UK is let's promise everything. There's a budget out generally about the time many of you will be listening to this. So tomorrow in our terms we'll see what's happened there and whether we're, we're right or wrong but this seems like easy bribery and then the how to actually pay for it will probably become somebody else's problem yeah that it would be much easier for them to promise these things if they know that they're not going to actually have to deliver or work out how to balance the books yeah i can see that i can see that as well sadly i wish i were wrong yeah <laughs> we sometimes feel we're not cynical enough <laughs> <laughs> right, I'm going to move us on to Polestar, and they have secured £750 million of extra funding. Now, this is all in the sort of the ongoing story. This could have been follow-up, really. The ongoing story of Polestar, Volvo stepping back from as much support as they were giving and, and all that sort of thing. And this is how Polestar are going to fulfill that gap in funding. They've got 12 international banks that have uh, given them a three-year loan for the uh, $950 million. Uh, and they think that this will help them hit their 2025 targets, where they wish to have annual sales of over 155,000 vehicles and become cash flow break even. Mm -hmm. Good luck to them. Yes. Discussing Subaru Solterra BZ4X to see far, far more by a factor of many pole stars uh, around here so yeah we've got uh, quite a number locally even in our grim northern town popular locally none in my garage downstairs it tends to be there's a few model y 
um, and then a couple of Kias and stuff. And then there's a Honda Clarity plug-in hybrid ugly thing as well, which is notable for its vileness, really. <laughs> well, talking of the US. Yes. The US, and I'm going to just read the, the title of this Electrive article, US wary of Chinese EVs collecting data. I'm going to dial this back a little bit. Right. The US basically is wary of Chinese EVs. I think that that is the important part here. <laughs> the collecting data and collecting of sensitive data, I, I think if, if the US was genuinely worried about that and transmitting it around the world, then it wouldn't matter which car manufacturer it was or where they were based in the world. True. And quite why they feel that China and beaming it back to China as opposed to, uh, say, German cars beaming it back to Germany is a different matter, or beaming it to India or, or wherever, that your data ends up if it goes via one of the other brands. It's all part of the protectionism and the worry about China anyway. Oh, right? you used the word protectionism. That's good. You beat me to it. Because I did see in the same week, there was lots of warnings about, and this, this may sound ridiculous, but this is a, a real concern, is the Chinese-made cranes imports sending back sensitive data. Wow. That's something they're looking at as well. Uh, as you say, though, because I saw a senator had brought this forward after this statement came out from Biden and has mm. written to the president and said, hang on, it's all cars that are collecting sensitive data. We need to stop this sort of thing, which will never happen because America doesn't seem to care mm. about privacy. Instead of stopping it at source, they, they allow another business to start up to try and help protect people. <laughs> it's so mad. It's such an American thing. Tell me about it. As someone who, who pays basically to have his biz personal data removed from data brokers, because why would we want GDPR or an equivalent in America? It's, it's ridiculous. I mean, it, it, don't even stop me on that kind of stuff over here. It, it sickens me, genuinely sickens me and makes me very angry. Yeah. Because it's just awful yeah and because people here aren't used to aren't used to anything else mm. then they just live with it and it, it's just it's the way it is i mean see also healthcare tipping yeah sorry i shall get down off it but there are many good things like nice sizes of refrigerators being greeted in restaurants with a glass of iced water and um <laughs> That's and, a very low bar. <laughs> and, and, and donuts, uh, which are very, very, th there are many, good, I, I always feel that if I'm doing an anti-America rant, I have to balance it with many of the things I do actually like here. It's our BBC rule. <laughs> it, it is a little bit. It's also the not a bitter expat rule. Yeah. Because yeah. if you sound like you're not enjoying it, you might as well just go home, which is, makes sense. Uh, anyway, so this one, anyway, back to the story. Back we've to the story. Because terribly. All cars, we, we, we need to remember, all cars collect an absolute shed load of data. There has been plenty of reports out in the last 12 months that show how much we know about it, how much the car companies tell us, and what happens to that data is still very, very murky, and we are still not being served very well. Some do it better than others. Some don't do it at all and just take stuff. Why, why don't the Chinese just buy it all from the data brokers anyway? That's what the, that's what the US government does. <laughs> that is a very valid uh, business, business strategy, that is for sure. But let's not forget, the Chinese also ban Teslas mm. at a high-ranking official meeting that they have every year because they suspect that the Teslas are doing the same thing that the US are accusing. Yeah. Want to investigate, sorry, want to investigate whether the Chinese EVs are doing. And we have to remember as well, how many actual Chinese EV brands are there in the US? I don't no, think no, it's no, many. They've already, all, they've already all been blocked, basically. Yeah. So this, this, is, um, this is a very good politician story where you can sound outrage, but nothing really is... The Environmental Protection Agents, uh, not Environmental Protection, well, the Environmental Protection Act, was it? The EPA. That's the agency. Oh, okay. Or whatever the act was last year, which means that you only get your, you only get subsidized electric vehicles if they're American. Yeah, yeah. Basically splatted the Chinese ones. That plus chicken tax and all the, the sort of uh, imported uh, small vehicle uh, rules. Yeah. Mean that that doesn't, they, they don't exist here. 
you know, you're not going to get an aura funky cat here. No. What, what I am waiting for in the UK now is for the British politicians to spot this and lose their minds because don't forget how they lost their minds over, uh, and to some justification, to be fair, over Chinese parts and elements in telecoms. Yeah, absolutely. And, and generally speaking, by the way, there is that sort of, oh, it's made in China type reaction to things here still. Yeah. Uh, very much so, whereas in Europe, I think we're like, oh, Chinese, whatever. It's as good as this, as good as it would be if it was made in, made in Europe in many cases. Mm -hmm. Anyway, whoa, high political horses are being mounted today. <laughs> Next week will be the one when we do discuss the budget as well. <laughs> I know, I know. It's going gonna, it's gonna to get really bad. But next story is one that I'm I'm kind of kind of sad to hear this one to be perfectly honest because I quite like this brand. Uh, yes, uh, this is the news that Fisker has announced in their uh, financial results that they are really struggling. They came out with a comment or a statement that they didn't know whether they could survive deep into 2024 because of their cash flow problems, but. Rumours abound that coming in on a white charger to save them is Nissan, allegedly. <laughs> they were apparently in talk with Mazda as well, but those have quietened down. Mm. But the Nissan are in talks to invest something in the region of $400 million, mainly because they can then get hold of an, an electric pickup platform. Yeah, it's the... I've not forgotten the name of it now. Alaska, I think. The Alaska, that's it. Which is funny because Renault had a, a, a pickup truck called the Alaska, which is sold in many European ma markets, which was a rebrand Nissan. <laughs> My first thought was Renault is going to do its nut over this. And then on reflection, I thought, well, actually, it's a platform that Renault's never going to offer. It's not going to be sold in Europe. So why should they? And it might ultimately benefit Renault as well. Yes, it depends on how standoffish this relationship is becoming. What, Renault-Nissan? Yeah, the, the Rebel Alliance is no more. It's very weak. Pretty much. They talk to each other and they sort of invest in each other, mm. but the amount that Nissan invested in Ampere was a lot lower than everyone was expecting. Yes. And you just get the sense that they are all trying to disentangle themselves oh, big time. from anything that they envisages negative. Which then makes me wonder how Nissan as a corporation would deal with working with something that is a smallish startup based in North America. Well, the thing is, well, I, I think the dynamics of the Rebel Alliance were the problem for Nissan, where Renault had too much power. In this one, they'll hold all the power over Fisker, so they'll be fine. Yeah, they'll be quite happy just waving their magic wand around. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's the flip side. It's certainly an interesting one. It's, it's certainly an unexpected one. Mm. Well, do you want to take us to the car that maybe never was, but definitely isn't now? Could possibly, maybe would, good, but th this was the, the sort of great looming, oh my goodness, is it, isn't it? And the whole... I'm still not convinced this didn't occur off the back of someone going, oh, I've got nothing to write about, bloody hell. Um, I know. Oh, generally, yeah. This will get a click. <laughs> what about, yeah, let's, let's, let's like Apple and Tesla is like clickbait heaven. <laughs> <laughs> and autonomous vehicles. <laughs> and autonomous vehicles, yes. Apple Project Titan, which we've covered on and off and desperately tried not to because the news has always been so hazy and vague that we, mm. we, we, we looked at it and went, oh, no, 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 no. There's, there's actual stuff to talk about. But supposedly, that's it. There's a senior executive has departed and all sorts of things. Apple has decided to cancel its Project Titan self-driving car thing. Apple, of course, hasn't publicly confirmed this decision. The register says they've all that it was doing it in the first place. Yeah. Supposedly, there are about 2,000 people working on the car. I'm not going to call it the iCar, as the register does throughout this. I think that is with tongue firmly in cheek, though. <laughs> yes, I would say so. I don't know. There's been lots of lots of stuff about this, uh, but supposedly it's now not happening. So there we go. Other than the fact that the reporting over this is genuine, generally pretty shocking, because it's tech journalists trying to talk about cars, and then car journalists trying to talk about tech, and near the twain shall meet Quite. in most cases. <laughs> I've met motoring journalists. I know how good many of them are with tech. 
<laughs> you watched it. Yeah, but the, the thing for me is this never really made sense for Apple to no. get into the car industry to build its own car because that exposed them so, so much on so many levels to regulatory and consumer issues. Whereas you can get away with it with a phone and a laptop and a PC and an iPad, you cannot get away with it in a car as some car manufacturers are fairly newish car manufacturers are beginning to find out when the the beast that is government investigations start to get moving in their direction finally decides to actually pay any attention to them yeah yeah i as as ever with any of these things i feel very sorry for the staff who are are apparently involved in this who have either been fired or are being reallocated which sounds really warm and cuddly doesn't it the the language from the tech industry is so oh it's well from businesses from big businesses is so gorgeous and warming and makes you really want to be loyal to them doesn't it (laughs) oh god well do you want to bring us back to britain but still talk about something that isn't going to (laughs) happen you mean the lagonda which i thought we'd already talked about we haven't talked about yet yeah that one yes supposedly Lauren Stroll has said that uh, Lagonda, obviously the saloon brand under Aston Martin, is now completely dead. This is a surprise to me. Why? (laughs) Because the last Lagonda was shown in 2018 and 2019, and then nothing was heard. And then there was an announcement that it wasn't happening. At that point, I thought it was completely dead. I didn't even believe there was the slightest twitch of life left in it. No. My surprise is, like yours, that it was still apparently a thing. Yeah, I, it I must have been a line gone. on a spreadsheet, and they finally went, "Oh, hang on, we need to get, we need to delete that line." Well, so yeah. What's that doing there? Yeah, yeah. It's a shame. I actually thought that the the sort of last concepts that they showed, certainly the low down ones. I mean, they looked a lot like a doodle in the in the margins of my school jotters, where it's all sort of super low one box job. I, it's a format which now you know we've just talked about Lucid and Lucid Air. Mm-hmm. Um, the Mercedes EQS, uh, all these, which is admittedly a more blobby rendition of it. But, you know, that idea very much there, very much coming through. But I think that now uh, all the other brands, everybody your brand is moving to being uh, to being electric. I think uh, Lagonda's left behind is probably the right decision, sadly. Yeah, they're just going to come out with, a, you know, like the Rapide. They'll just do something like that. Yeah, exactly. Well, it was a Lagonda Rapide. Or, or just stick with SUVs. Yeah. That would make the last Lagonda the Taraf, the sort of Middle Eastern only saloon. It's very cool. I saw one in London once. Oh, right. Looks good. Oh, well, do you want to finish out the first part of the show by talking about yet another thing that is being canned? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, uh, everyone. It, that just seems to have had, run there. It wasn't deliberate. Yeah. <laughs> you know it's long enough that, to know that we aren't clever enough to have <laughs> put that together. Yeah. Uh, Nissan is uh, halting support of its Nissan Connect EV app, which is used to connect to the Leaf and the ENV200 uh, van. Made before 2016. Yes, which are now seven years old. And it's going to shut down from the 1st of April this year. Uh, And it's saying, in preparation for the 2G technology sunset, I said that, said, well, that makes sense. And Andrew said, it's not happening for six years yet? Six to nine years. Six to nine years. It's good to be prepared in advance, (laughs) but owners of these elderly Nissan Leaf and ENV 200s, which are still perfectly good vehicles and still running just fine, and will continue to run, by the way, it's the ability to schedule charging easily and remotely and other things like that, which which they're going to lose, and, you know, the ability to turn on the climate control remotely. But, you know, the vehicle will still run, but the app will no longer function. Yeah, that that seems quite a a lame excuse why they're shutting it down it, it so is. far in advance. Because if they'd waited right up until six to nine years when it goes off, there would hardly be any cars left running at that point because they would be 15 yeah. years old, some uh-huh. of them. Uh, so it just, or it's even an, older. So it just seems so, such a daft thing to do. But then, as we were saying before we, we hit record on the show, maybe we do need to change up what we've been saying and happily been shouting that you can't call a car a mobile on wheels. And maybe we now need to say, looking at the way this is happening and the of effectively one month's notice, maybe they are 
they are learning all the wrong lessons from the tech industry again and yeah, how to oh. treat people. <laughs> but the thing is that with parts and things, the manufacturers have to have to be able to support vehicles for 10 years after the end of their manufacture. With parts, there are rules around I, I, that. I think EU's looking to expand that to 15, you know, in line yeah. with, was it Renault that said we should I think be talking they, 15 I think they were was it talking. Peugeot? Anyway, it was uh, one, it of, the was one of the French companies. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. Uh, and I think that those rules should really, I mean, it's a 15-year-old, can, can you imagine using a 15-year-old laptop? It's fairly getting there, isn't it? Uh. It's now an integral part of the vehicle. How it's different from some of the other parts, like em- emissions parts and these kind of things, is it, it is it is part of the vehicle and the vehicle system. And that it should, this kind of thing should be covered by that. Now, it may be limping along and almost unusable and terrible, but if people want to be able to use it or need to be able to use it, then they can. Yeah. You know, yeah. we all know it's going to be, it's going to be like, I always joke British Airways, IT infrastructure. It's going to be an old laptop sitting in the corner of a server room somewhere, gathering dust and coffee stains. Uh, and that's all that's going to be running it. And goodness knows that's what runs an awful lot of IT these days before it's moved to the cloud. Uh, but there should still be some level of support. They shouldn't be able to just shut stuff off with a month. If nothing else, it gives the aftermarket time and room to be able to fudge together some kind of solution. I know somebody's going to come up with the security of that. It's entirely the people who purchase it's problem, as far as I'm concerned. No, but this is where the right to repair and all this needs to be considered, particularly with the Internet of Things, because that's basically what this is. is it, It's one of the eco, part of the ecosystem of the Internet of Things. If you're connecting something up to a bit of technology, it must be built in from now on, or should have been done beforehand, yeah. that you allow aftermarket stuff to be done as long as it hits certain criteria for security, safety, and that sort of stuff as well. Yeah, but you're spending so much money on all the development of the, the, the car and so that you can make some money uh, when there's not a lot of money to be made on cars, mass market yeah. cars, then that's the last thing anyone wants to do. And I can completely understand why that's the case. They're not wrong in the decision, but they could be more right to do it, if you, you get what I mean. Uh-huh. Uh, and But I think that whenever stuff gets older like this, then at least a bit of a ramp up to uh, to allow people to have sort of know that there's a solution needs to be developed and then somebody's going to hack something together. I mean, we can we can put money on the fact there'll be some kind of wire, wireless OBD2 device. Mm. Oh, yeah, Wi-Fi-based OBD2 device will appear pretty soon and a uh, slightly shonky web interface which will then get developed. Yeah, because the, the need for the type of profit that a small company developing that is totally different to Nissan requiring mm-hmm. across its millions of people employed uh, yeah. and uh, all across the globe. It's, it's different as scales and it's different of perspective mm-hmm. and, you know, what your aims are. Yeah, absolutely. On which happy note, it's Guilt Minute. Quick break in the show where we ask for a tad of financial support to keep the lights on and the hosting running. If you feel the motoring podcast worth a small consideration every month, then you can become a patron. Different levels of patron include different levels of commitment from us to you, including being able to watch the show recorded live. We have a small range of merchandise in our spring store, from stickers to mugs and t-shirts. If you don't have any spare cash, and we do completely understand, then you can help us by following for free from our podcast player to receive every show as they're released, and by liking and rating the show in whatever way your podcast supply lets you. If you've done all that, some of you do, so thank you very much, then the last thing you can do is to recommend us to your friends or colleagues. Thank you everyone that does. Very, Mm -hmm. very much appreciated. Okay, new, new car news, and we're talking about the car we wouldn't talk about last week, the Renault 5 e-tech. Everybody else was talking about it last week. Yes, and we'd only got the story just before the uh, mm. the show, so we wanted some time to digest it, and then hash out how we're going to try and present it to you. Um, <laughs> but this was revealed at Geneva last week, and is a, if you have lived under a rock, or many rocks, uh, in the in the recent times, then this is a design that uh, harks back to the Renault Five design of old. Mm-hmm. Definite nods to it, but it's a small, smallish, uh, small jacked up thing. It's not quite an SUV. It's not uh, a hatchback. It's it's pumped up. It, it's a late Renault Five that has spent some time in the gym in order to be able to accommodate a battery pack under the floor. Yeah. 
And prices are um, apparently going to start from £26,000. Where did I see that? At £25,000, apparently, um, with deliveries set to start in early 2025. That will make it, at the moment, one of the cheapest EVs in the Mm -hmm. UK, which is good. Obviously, the car corner of the internet went mental for this and declared their loves, and even saw one or two people actually putting down deposits for it already. So, well done, Renault. You have done a trick here with your design. But it's not just the outside, is it? The inside is really rather lovely. Yeah, and harks back to the the earlier Renault 5s with that padded dash, the way that the instrument clusters are. I mean, obviously, it's still got a touchscreen and all that kind of stuff because you, you kind of have to have these days. But it all still ties into that same theme. I think what they've done that's so clever with this is it's not only funky and modern looking, it appeals to both younger people uh, and it appeals to older people who had Renault 5s in the past who remember the Renault 5 and, go, and you can very, very clearly see the styling links both outside and in. And I think at the very least, it's going to draw people into showrooms. Mm. I think they've done a bit of a new beetle with this. Yeah, it, it does remind me of like when the Mini came out, Yeah, uh, the Beetle. And I did see some people complaining, saying, why are you always, why are car companies going back to try and gain interest? But I know that that's a, it's an easy way in which to bring a new, because it's new technology. Don't forget, for so many people, an electric car is still new technology for them. Yeah. Um, they've not had one. This, this could be their first electric vehicle. You do need to wrap it up in an, in, in a, uh, wrap it up in such a way that they're not threatened by it. It's the opposite to the Nissan Leaf. The Nissan Leaf was new EV, looked like an iron. You know, looked like when it was first, when it was new, I mean, it looked like an appliance. It was not interesting. And people, yeah. but people bought it because they wanted an EV. Yes. Here, and this is the new, this is the new paradigm that I think we really need to be in. Sim- similarly with Tesla. It doesn't look great. People bought it because it's an EV. Here, people bought by it because it's the R5. Because it yeah. looks cool and it's great. And hey, it's an EV and that's kind of good these days. So that's great. Let's do it. I might as well have something I like the look of. I want to drive in. Yeah. Uh, and that kind of thing. And, and that's where stuff like the Model Y and things, it's, it's, you know, it's wantonly ugly, but it's an EV. So people who want an EV buy it. Mm. Here, people who want an interesting car are buying it and it happens to be an EV. Yeah. Hopefully we're going to see more of that. Yeah, hopefully we will. But I love it. Great. I think it's good. I think it looks it. I think it's going to have wide appeal. I really want this to be a success. It's going to sell like hotcakes in France. Just going to lap it up. Yep. Totally. Well, do you want to take us to something new but old? Given that everything I've just said, <laughs> that what we now have is an old brand where, where there is nothing to link it back to the past. It's the new MG3 was one of the other four reveals at uh, Geneva. In 2024, it's only going to be available as a hybrid, not as an EV, but it's meant to be more powerful, more efficient uh, than any of its rivals. The idea is that it's uh, it, the, the, the MG3 is now a rival to, say, the Yaris or the Clio E-Tech uh, in terms of hybrids. It's going to have, in theory, a 100 horsepower, 1.5 liter petrol engine with a 134 brake horsepower electric motor. Overall, that adds up in the magic of the way that these add up to 191 brake horsepower and 0 to 62 of 8 seconds, which seems quick. That's brisk for something like this. Yeah, but it's going to be heavy. So 1.83 kilowatt hour battery, uh, which means they're saying an extensive electric only range. Looks wise, it's generic Chinese hatchback alike, I guess. Yeah, if you if you think... Somebody has been shown a picture of the last generation Fiesta and then told to make it a bit swoopier, slashier. Yeah, make that it look more like a whale at the front. These kind of things. <laughs> so it's got kind of it's going to scoop up krill as it drives along. <laughs> then that's that's pretty much that. But we're getting another uh, B segment hatch option. Yes, which are which are falling by the wayside. Uh, there are going to be two versions, by the way, the SE and the Trophy. Even the stand, the SE trim will have a 10.25-inch touchscreen. Yay, says Andrew. Uh, with integrated Apple Play, Android Auto, sat-nav, along with a 7-inch little digited display in front of the driver. 
uh, have parking cameras, assistance tech, all of that kind of thing. Uh, Trophy will bring keyless entry, heated front seats, 360 degree camera, going to be priced from 14320 so what, that's going to be one of the cheapest new cars available. Yeah. I'm going to take it to something that we aren't actually going to see on the roads, but uh, is fun nevertheless, so we've included it, and that's the Dacia Sandrider. They are actually going to the Dakar Rally, uh, and mm. this is what they're going to do it in, in this really funky... I do like Dacia's current uh, concept car design language yes. that they're going for. They've had some real crackers come out. Um, they seem to be given quite a lot of freedom. Mm-hmm. But yeah, this is going to be a rally raid, which I, again, I think would make perfect family transportation. Yes. It's the way that the uh, the spare tires are mounted in uh, um, midships uh, on both sides. I think they're almost like they can be fired as though you're on... Uh, this is, what, Mario Kart? Mario Kart. So you can take out your opposition by just firing these massive tires at <laughs> Uh, inside, it's not overflowing with luxury and comfort. Well, hang on a minute. The the, the seats are are lim- lined with antibacterial and humidity regulating fabric, and the dashboard <laughs> is finished in anti reflective paint to reduce glare. Says Autocar. That steering wheel looks a very odd shape. It is. I have a funny feeling that might change for when yes, it's actually I, I raised as well. uh, for a, a standard one. But yes, it it's, it looks it's uh, chunkier than a BMW M cars. Uh, when you look at look at the rim, the rim on it there, yeah. um, it's, looks ace. it's it's kind of cool. Um, powered by uh, not anything new or fantastic, but by a twin turbo charged three liter V six. Understood to be based on that used by sibling band N- Nissan's four hundred Z coupe, the the invisible Z car. So that means that, by the way, it's a derivation of the VQ motor. It's it's actually a V R motor but derivation of eq motor so it will um still sound like pants but it will run on synthetic fuel send 355 brake horsepower and 398 pounds foot of torque to both axles through a six-speed sequential gearbox so as you say andrew perfect for the shopping run <laughs> it's going to run in the 2025 world rally raid championship it does look good yes it's like the off-road cousin of the citroen ollie isn't it <laughs> yes yeah Okay, do you want to bring us a bit back down to earth and something a bit more realistic? Yeah, we're back to cheap electric cars, where cheap is is for a given value of the word cheap. The Vauxhall Corsa electric uh, has been notably expensive so far, with many people going, £40,000 for a Corsa, and some of us going, that's what they cost, I'm afraid. Well, they've introduced a new trim level, which slashes the entry price by £5,550, uh, making it the cheapest EV on sale in the UK. It's the Corsa, yes! And it starts at £26,895, uh, which is a smidgen, like £100 cheaper than the MG4 EV and a couple of hundred pounds cheaper than the electric Fiat 500E. 134 brake horsepower, £191 foot of torque, blah, 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 blah. 50 kilowatt hour battery offering up to 221 miles in range in a single charge, which is pretty good pretty mm-hmm. adequate i'd say yeah. uh, it'll be available to order from the 17th of april on the Vauxhall website uh, you get 16 inch alloys front sport seats a seven inch digital instrument cluster 10 inch touchscreen with carplay and android auto you also got automatic led lamps automatic wipers climate control what the heck have they taken out of this to save five thousand five hundred and fifty pounds i don't know i don't know whether they're doing this as a loss leader i think it must be because it's got a lot of what you'd want. It seems a pretty good. I don't know why you'd want much more. To be perfectly honest, that's a perfectly no. good driving around your car. What makes the near nigh on forty k one better? So but much better than this. You probably get fake leather seats, and you probably get adaptive cruise control, and all that kind of stuff. But I don't. I don't. If you buy, the range will be different as well. I can't remember what. The yeah, range I'm is. sure the range will be more. But but. But that seems pretty good, to be honest. I, I quite yeah, like 15K the same thing. 15k difference. I'm not sure. I'm not sure difference. what you get the 15k difference. I, I think that this one, I think there's a high likelihood this will become the immediate bestseller. Yeah, I can, I can see we're going to be talking about courses at number one. Yeah, I, well, I, I, I don't have a, for fleet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't have an issue with that at all. Yeah, I no, think no, it's pretty good. Anything, so, anything that helps drive the price of new EVs down is good. 
one other line that I noticed in this Autico article, in a bid to lure buyers, Waxal uh, will offer the model with a year's free charging at Tesco supermarkets across the country, which again, probably costs them nearly nothing, but mm. is a very, it takes away a level of uncertainty. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Cool. Obviously, the Dacia Spring, when it comes out, will become uh, will become significantly cheaper at about seventeen thousand uh, pounds, but I think you'll find that there's a significant difference between the two vehicles. It's almost a hundred mile different range as well. It's ninety miles range difference. Uh, if yeah, there is ninety, you. but but also just the build quality and all these kind yeah, of yeah. things. The 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 course will be miles ahead. That seems like yeah. a stonking deal. I, I that would be very tempting as a just get around the place car. Yeah, very very absolutely. tempting indeed. Mm-hmm. More Nissan, lots of Nissan Leaf news this this week. Well, there was two. <laughs> I feel that's more than we normally have by a yeah. considerable margin. And it's not autumn, so they haven't fallen. But this is the news that uh, the Sunderland production of the Nissan Leaf is coming to a close as they prepare themselves for the new model that will be built uh, in the factory. I saw some fantastically wonderful commentary on why Nissan were silly to not keep this going. But this has been a massively important model um, oh, no, for has. EVs, for Nissan, and for the car industry. Yeah, it has, uh, and and yeah, and also for for that corner of of the UK. Mm. I was working with Nissan just about the point where they were they were building the 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 battery cell factory there, the original ones. So obviously, the model's been around for a while, and there'll be new models coming through Sunderland to replace it. Mm-hmm. European car of the year. Hard to think of a blander lineup I've ever seen. I mean, the finalists were the Nissan, Renault Scenic, the BMW 5 Series, the BMW Peugeot 3008, the Kia EV9, the Volks, Volvo EX30, the BYD Seal, and the Toyota CHR. It was won by the Renault Scenic, which, to be honest, when I first saw the picture, I thought was a Peugeot. Well, yeah, that was the one that we commented on, wasn't it? Because the, uh, and this was just after the Peugeot designer had moved to Renault as well. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it, it's, <laughs> this is going to be completely and totally. Uh, forgettable car of the year. It must have been very difficult for them to judge those. Yep. That sounds really dismissive, but they're just, it's just like blancmange. Yeah. Well, talking of cars that were tricky to narrow down to be winners, even though we're going to be talking about some of the same ones you've just been dismissive of, and this is the UK Car of the Year Awards. And the... Uh... <laughs> there is more excitement and interest in this. I'm sorry. The, the, the choices here were more are more interesting than what we've just seen. Sorry, I've just... There's several of what you just talked about, though. And the yeah, category but... award winners have been announced. Um, we are still waiting on news of which car has won overall, but the category award winners are as follows. Think of this as a quick list of the week extra. Uh, small car was won by the Renault Clio. The family car was the Hyundai Ioniq 6. The small crossover was the Volvo EX30. Medium crossover was the Fisker Ocean. Large crossover, the Kia EV9. Executive car was the BMW i5. And performance car was the Honda Civic Type R. Now, if you remember a couple of weeks ago, we did the show uh, one day early because I went off to drive most of these cars at the uh, driving day for while well, we finalized our decision, uh, myself and the other judges that arrived. There's about 30 judges in total. It describes this as the biggest and best ever judging panel. Well, yes. Okay. I've put weight on. What can I say? Yes. <laughs> okay. Despite your inclusion. You know some of the other judges, so be careful what you say. I know, I know, I know. <laughs> and they know you more importantly. Of my choices for these, three have won their category. So uh, I agree. Well, they wouldn't necessarily be my choices. Mm-hmm. But we find out next week <laughs> what is the overall winner. So even us on the judging don't know yet. We, it's not like we're under a... a NDA. Yeah, and a NDA or anything like that. We just don't know. But there is a link in the show notes to the UK Car of the Year Award. So if you could click through and have a read of that, that would be brilliant. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, points of interest next. And the long time read comes from Road and Track. And it's called, yes. We put a Lamborghini Mura in a wind tunnel to see how fast supercar aero has come. I can't read the rest of the article, Andrew. Can you fill in, please? <laughs> it's excellent. It's written by Jethro Bovington, and it just 
just goes through how um, how things have changed over the time from basically you know the sixties when things were drawn gorgeously, but now how high tech it is, and they they put up some. Uh, there's a lot of uh, information on how they use aero now in modern cars and the, and the likes. It's a really fascinating read um, using. I think it was just a cheap excuse just to talk about a Murai as well, which is Works always for worthy. Me. <laughs> yes. Works for me. I'm not going to make fun of that at all. Uh, yeah, sadly, it's paywalled here in North America. So, uh, uh, yeah, unless you're a road and track subscriber. But you should be able to see it in the UK. So it is awesome. I, I love finding out stuff like this, the, the engineering behind things. It's wonderful. Okay, list of the week then. You, so you can see this, though. Yeah, and it's from the Autopian, and <laughs> let's talk car names you couldn't use today. <laughs> I like this because it is one of those Autopian articles where they don't just go down the usual stuff. It's like having a worst cars article where people have actually put some effort into it and not just chosen the Austin Allegra. Yeah, I mean, some of them are the, the whole sort of the, the the whole sort of we're not sure if 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 the 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 names are good or bad in any way, shape, or form, but they are suitably weird. <laughs> there is the occasional one that we we all know, but yeah, uh, it's. Uh, am I meant to be choosing one? Yes, this is. The, w- what's the one name for a car that stands out as more? Ooh, okay, <laughs> than any others. For I'm you. going to choose the one which is is at the very end, and it's listed as the car name you think is bad, but you're wrong about, and that's the Ford Probe. Because they're explaining that, you know, really, it's a good thing, despite the humorous connotations there might be, that makes it the butt of many jokes. Um, Which is still, it's still quite good. It's actually quite a good name, apart from the jokes, for a a sort of smooth-looking coupe. If only they'd used one in the picture. (laughs) Well, yes, it was the 1980s, all right? The 1989 Ford Probe. But the, the rest of the list is, is great as well. Um, I think there's some which I just didn't even think of. Uh, and whenever you, you read it, you go, yeah, okay, that's, um, that's quite bad. <laughs> or, or definitely not allowed now. So it's nice to see it. It's nice to see it with a, just something different in this kind of particular style of list. Uh, that brings me to the end finally uh, and finally this week is uh, one of and I'm sure many many of you watch these anyway uh, but I really enjoy auto shenanigans on YouTube and uh, the fact that John is creating new content that other people haven't yeah. in a new sort of genre of stuff and he's talking about the A39 uh, Paul Lock Hill in Somerset the rally stage you can drive on and the steepest A road simultaneously. Uh, the, no, not simultaneously. The rail station driver and the steepest A road uh, in the UK. They are two separate roads, but they take you between the same places. But very cool. Yes. Yeah. Do click the link in the show notes and have a watch of that. It's only six minutes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's 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 a good one. John's stuff is uh, one of the. It's amazing how much he fits into under ten minutes. Yes. All the stuff's under 10 minutes. The research is phenomenal that must go into these. Yeah, yeah. It's a lot of time, uh, work, and effort into those into those short bits. Uh, really cool stuff. That's us for this week. Uh, no parish notes this week either, which mm-hmm. means all that's left is for me to remind you that between now and next week, you can give us any feedback, share your thoughts on the show, at Motoring Podcast on Twitter and Instagram, on Facebook, and on the contact page of motoringpodcast.com up of all our activities uh, remember you can support us financially via Patreon and please leave a review rating on Apple Podcasts or however your podcast app lets you do such a thing uh, it really is uh, appreciated uh, don't forget to like and subscribe if you watch the YouTube feed as well Andrew what's the best way to get in touch with you best way to get in touch with me is if you search for Crack Windscreen on Twitter or Mastodon you should find me there and Alan if people would like to get in touch with you personally what's the best way for them to do that Best way, uh, Twitter or Blue Sky, uh, where I'm at AJP Bradley. That's B R A D L E Y. Uh, as I said, we'll be back very soon. But until then, I've been Alan Bradley. I've been Andrew Clues. And safe motoring. <laughs>